All right, I think we should be live. Let's see how the video is doing. <clears throat> and chat should be coming online in just a second. Hopefully. All right, well, I am Drew Badger, the founder of EnglishAnyone.com and the English Fluency Guide. And in this video, we're going to talk about basically getting fluent, speaking confidently, understanding natives, all of those things. And the foundation of all of that is how you learn. Uh, so if you are new to the channel, look at that Nils there right at the beginning. Nice to see you there. Everybody is working, chat is working, and we should be all right. Okay. <clears throat> all right. All right. So as I just mentioned today, yes, we are going to be covering how you learn is how you speak because often people think that there are lots of reasons why they're not becoming fluent, and there's really just one main reason. And this is the same thing that happened to me as I was trying to learn Japanese and even other languages and I still could not become a fluent speaker even if I had private lessons, even if I lived in a, like a native country. So even living in Japan, I still didn't become a fluent speaker uh, until I changed the way I learned. Uh, so I will get back to comments. I will keep an eye on those as I go through this, uh, but hopefully, it should be a pretty, well, it should be a pretty quick video, and then I will take any questions people have. Uh, but really, the core idea of what I do is that how you learn is the most important thing about how you speak. So even if you do live in an English-speaking country, even if you do practice, treat, like you try to practice speaking and you still don't feel fluent, uh, even if you're studying for many hours a day, even if you think you're you know, like 10 years old and you're young enough, whatever your reason is, if you're still not getting fluent, it's just because of how you learn. And so as I usually cover, uh, just very quickly, so we have English, if you're learning English in typical lessons, uh, I really want to highlight a few different pieces of this. Uh, so you, in, when you're learning English in, uh, in like a traditional classroom, you've got English as a second language lessons. So that means you're learning English through your native language and then you're also studying grammar rules. You're really trying to learn the language logically. You're trying to put a whole bunch of rules in your head, but then often you will have trouble communicating. Uh, and then there is the English as a first language where you're actually trying to learn English like a native speaker and even more efficiently than a native speaker because you're getting the right input and you're also getting the right review. I can talk more about that in this video if you'd like, uh, but really the core of this video is talking about the two different kinds of English that you learn. And so the first one is really just like, we'll just call this the school English and this is more, uh, it's not incorrect English, it's just the typical language you would find for writing. And so it's much different than how you might find in like spoken English. So real conversations. Uh, and the, the, the differences here, just from this, make all the difference for how you speak. And so if you're only learning this kind of English, then of course this kind of English will be much more difficult to understand. All right. So uh, the main difference is uh, just be between the kinds of English. So number one, uh, this is going to be typically slower. And so even me right now, I'm speaking more slowly, more clearly, so you can understand what I'm saying. Uh, and then spoken is going to be faster. And some people speak more slowly. Some people speak faster. It just, you know, it just depends on the conversation. But most language uh, in an ESL classroom is supposed to be slower so you can understand what people are saying. Uh, and of course we also have the vocabulary is different. So the vocabulary, uh, we'll just call this textbook that fits on there. Oh no, that's not fitting on there. <coughs> uh, we'll just say textbook. So textbook English. Uh, and then this is real speech over here. And what I mean by real English is obviously the questions and answers and conversation, that kind of thing that you would get in a real conversation. So if I'm speaking in a textbook, I would say, how are you today? I'm being very slow, very clear. So again, I'm being slow, speaking in clear English, and I'm also, again, speaking clearly. Uh, but then I'm also using just 
the language that you would get that you would typically find in a textbook. So slow English, textbook English, uh, but then in a real conversation, I might say, how's it going? So textbook English, how are you today? How are you today? But in a real conversation, how's it going? How's it going? So if I write this, I'm saying, how is it going? And it here means your life. How are things? How is your life? But you'll notice how this blends together to how zit. It's like how zit going. How's it going? So I've got the different vocabulary and I'm pronouncing it faster, less clearly. I'm blending my speech together. Uh, and again, this is a, a big part of the reason why people are learning this and then they have trouble understanding this. So this is, ju again, just another example of how you learn is how you speak. So if you learn this, then you are going to speak this. And you will also have trouble understanding people if they speak like this. Okay? But if you learn this, then you can understand people, and then you can understand uh, not only real conversations, but TV shows, movies, that kind of thing. And that's will, uh, that will allow you to understand and speak clearly. All right? So you can express yourself. And so what do we do? This is one of the big problems for most English learners is how do we get from here over to here? <clears throat> so again, we've got slow speech. Uh, it's usually less clear. I'll just put this. I can just say less clear over here. Uh, and then often here, this is all just add like blended, blended speech. So if you have already learned like this, so you can understand what I'm doing right now in these videos, usually I'm teaching this. So I will often teach some native English, but I will, I will give it to you in a slow, easy way. All right. So I'm, I'm kind of blending these two things together. I'm speaking more slowly than I usually speak, and I'm speaking more clearly than I usually speak. But I might teach you some actual conversational speech and walk you through that. Because what I'm trying to do is move you from this level over to here, all right? So this is one piece of how native speech is different from what you learn in the classroom. And this is why often students will say, wow, it's, I learned all this and I know all this English, but I have trouble understanding natives. And so again, we're just talking about it's, it's really two different languages. So there's different vocabulary, different speed, different clarity. So how clear the sound is. Can you understand what people are saying? And so this is one big part of why people struggle. All right. So it's not your fault if you understand this, but you have trouble understanding this. What you need to do is actually just start moving from here over to here. All right. So this is something you can easily do uh, by yourself or with someone like me, but I wanted to show you how to do that in this video. All right. Uh, but first, let me check comments just to make sure we're all on the same page here. I think I taught that phrase a while back to be on the same page. Uh, greetings from Honduras. Nice to see everybody there, Serge. Olympia. Let's see. Wilmer. Uh, oh, Olympia is a high teacher. I was talking about you and suddenly you appeared. Awesome. Hopefully it was something good. <laughs> So often like in English, we say, speak of the devil, speak of the devil and he appears, speak of the devil and he appears. So often you might be speaking about someone and they oh like, oh, look at that. There, there, that person, <laughs> there, that person goes. Mukesh says, uh, hi, Mukesh from India. Nice to see you there. Uh, Abba says, okay, just tell us how to speak English as good as native uh, English speakers and how do we practice? Yes, that's what we're getting to. Uh, but again, I know people like, just, just tell me the answer. But if I, tell you, if I tell you the answer, if I just say like, just do this, then a lot of people don't understand what exactly to do. That's not really good advice. Basically, the idea, the, the core idea is how you learn is how you speak. So if you only learn this over here, then of course you will have trouble understanding natives and you will have trouble expressing yourself. So we need to move from here to here. So it's good to learn this vocabulary, but you also need to learn this vocabulary and get used to these kinds of speakers over here. All right. All right. So let's continue looking at comments uh, very quickly. Let's see. And Bruno again, I see you there. Drew, how's it going? Glad to be here again. It's a pleasure. Uh, hi there. Teacher says Joe Bear, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. 
Hope you're having a good day. I am having a good day. I'm having a nice day, actually. It's nice to see you guys. And uh, most says, I was wrong about the idea of fluency come to live in an English-speaking country. I lived for two years in America and make no progress. Yes. And so, again, uh, these are the, the, the beliefs that I like to deal with uh, when students are learning the language. Even if you live in an English-speaking country, Lots of them, lots of people living in English-speaking countries don't become fluent speakers. And there are lots of reasons why this happens. Uh, but the number one reason is because they don't learn like natives. Okay? So the location, it's nice. It's a good thing. I, I would always say it's a good thing if you can live in the place where you're learning. So like me, living in Japan is nice for learning Japanese. It's better than, I don't know, being in the middle of some American state where nobody speaks any Japanese at all, but even with the internet now, it is possible to get lots of the input uh, that I need to become fluent. Uh, and so even though I lived in Japan for a year, I still didn't become a fluent speaker. It was only after I changed the way I learned. So once I started learning like a native, then I became fluent like a native, okay? So that's how it works. So again, living in an English-speaking country is great if you can do it, but often for a lot of people this is not possible, uh, but it's also not necessary. All right, it's how you learn, not how much vocabulary you accumulate. Yes, that's correct. Uh, and again, another point about that as a uh, mousey, let me know if I'm, if it's like moosey or mousey, mousey, moosey, it looks like moosey too. Uh, but <clears throat> again, yes, even native English speaking children, they know fewer words than adult native English or adult English learners. Uh, and because of that, they can speak fluently just because of how they learned. So even though a child might know fewer words, because they learn like a native, they can communicate with, with that vocabulary. Uh, and I guess another point I will add to that is you become fluent in particular vocabulary by understanding that vocabulary. So you don't become fluent in the whole language, you become pieces of it, usually one piece at a time. So if you don't understand some words, then you can't use them fluently. But other words that you do understand, you can use them fluently. And so you can speak about like maybe some things at work. So often I will have people, they ask me questions like, uh, Drew, I can speak well with my colleagues at work, but when they ask me about stuff outside of work, that's when I hesitate and struggle and have trouble communicating. All right. So it's not because you're you, you like lack fluency in general. It's just you don't know uh, much about that particular uh, vocabulary. So whatever that is. And so you learn the vocabulary in pieces. You have to learn it in pieces and understand it that way. Uh, let's see. Tsubazir, Ohio gozaimasu, Jobert. Again, you are a truly special teacher. Oh, you're too kind. Thank you very much for the pleasure. Uh, well, it's my pleasure to be here and help you guys, actually. Aaron is back. I watch a video from Singapore. Uh, Warda says hello from Indonesia and uh, Siva Kumar. Your video on phrasal verbs opened my eyes about the subject and since then been focusing on that part. Yeah, phrasal verbs are an excellent way to improve because they really cover everything about learning from vocabulary and grammar to pronunciation, uh, listening, everything really you can improve just by practicing uh, phrasal verbs. You can also build uh, obviously a great, uh, a great vocabulary very quickly because they allow you to learn just a few words and then combine them in different ways. Uh, so it really is a great way to learn how to how to understand the language like a native speaker. Gabriel says, which state did you grow up? Uh, so I, I grew up in uh, Chicago, which is in Illinois, the state of Illinois. Uh, so you are live streaming. I thought you are replying. Do you mean replying? What's up, Doc? Yes, uh, we are live right now. But if you watch this after we are live, then we are not live. <laughs> so it just depends. But yes, uh, currently I am doing this live. Uh, but the, the replays are always available for people to watch later. I know everybody can't watch at the same time. Uh, we have learners all over the world, and it's, it's basically impossible to have it be live while everyone is awake. Uh, let's see. Uh, Burgess says, hello, Gabriel again. Uh, Tambium. I don't know what that means. Jose again, uh, here in Honduras, I am seeing you. You are a good teacher, good learning, good teacher, good lecture. Give us my teacher. <laughs> well, it's my pleasure, Fatima. Hello. Uh, let's see more people. Good morning, Drew from Vietnam. Best teacher, best teacher here, guys. Thanks, teacher. God bless you. And greetings from El Salvador. All right. Well, now that we've covered all of those, I think everybody understands this. So let's talk about how we move from this to this over here. Now, as we mentioned, uh, it's important to understand these different pieces of this. So really, we've got slower speech 
and we've got the different vocabulary and also the speech can be less clear so it's more difficult to understand and so if you try to jump directly to this over here uh, as an example you're just taking english classes or you're watching english learning youtube videos on youtube and then you try to watch a movie it's going to be more difficult to understand things because the speech will be faster, the vocabulary will be different, uh, and then of course it's going to be much less clear. So what I'm always recommending is that you do this in steps. And it's actually easy to, to focus on each of these particular things uh, for your situation. So maybe for you, your problem uh, is that you know a lot of the native, this kind of real English over here, like slang and idioms, but you have trouble catching it quickly, like it's just coming too fast for you. So you can actually work on just the speed by itself and the vocabulary, maybe that's not such an issue for you. Uh, or again, the same thing, if maybe you, you can understand the speech but you just don't know the vocabulary, uh, you can do the same thing as well, just by focusing on one of these. But it's important to learn these things in steps. Now, before I go any further about this, I want to, I want to just show a different way uh, of learning than what most people typically do. So in the ESL, which is English as a second language, when you're learning the ESL way, typically what people are doing is they will learn some vocabulary and then they will repeat that vocabulary. So it's typically the same thing. A teacher will say something and then they will repeat that again and again. Or maybe you watch a video in a classroom about people talking, but it's usually not a real situation. Uh, it's not a... Uh, like, like a natural way that people would be speaking. So people have a script and they're reading from that or they're speaking, it's something they've been practicing. And, and again, it's just not the same thing as the language you would find in a real conversation. So uh, because you learn this way, like you can think about the ESL way as like learn something and then repeat it. And we're just gonna repeat something again and again and again, and hopefully you understand it and remember it. All right, but notice how we're we're staying in the same place. Uh, I'm I'm not really drawing this correctly. I don't have a lot of space. I should erase some of this. But the the basic idea here is if you repeat things, you're not actually moving over here. You're not moving from this side over to this side. So as an example, if I'm in a classroom and I'm teaching my students, how are you today? and I'm being very clear, very easy to understand, I'm pronouncing every word, how are you today? How are you today? How are you today? And so each time I just have the class, students repeat those things again and again. How are you today? How are you today? How are you today? How are you today? Are you, today? you notice we're staying over here, okay? We're not moving over here. I'm not teaching anything faster. I'm not teaching any different vocabulary. Uh, and I'm not giving you more difficult pronunciation, all right? So more difficult meaning it's harder to understand, all right? So the way we move from here over to here is to take maybe one of these things and we're going to change it in some way. It's kind of like a science experiment where we're comparing two different things. Like if I'm teaching, sometimes I will do a very simple Japanese lesson for people to learn Japanese, uh, just so you can remember what it's like to learn Japanese or remember like your first language. So my Japanese learners, this won't work on them <laughs> very well, but they get the idea. So, aka, akai maka, au, au, aka, au, kudo, kudo, kudo e maka. So here, uh, I'm not going to give you a lot of review, but the basic idea is you can look at this and your brain is trying to figure out what's different. So what do I mean? And because all of these things are the same, the only thing that's different is the color. And so it's easier to understand that, and especially if I begin teaching other things, like I take something else over here, and now I've got kudo, ao, aka, 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 aka. And so you look at that and you think, oh, look at that, like this thing and this thing, what is the same about those? It's the color, all right? So I could be talking about something else, but probably not, all right? <clears throat> so this is how your brain works and your brain is really trying to figure out 
what language means. And because often people are learning a language through their native language, they have to take extra steps to translate and understand what something means because they don't understand it directly the same way native does. So right here, I'm giving you a lesson, like a Japanese lesson as a first language, just to show you that it is possible for you to do that. And even though this is a basic thing, uh, it works the same way at any level of the language, all right? So going back to the example over here, instead of taking something like a, a phrase like, how are you today? I'm just going to abbreviate that as like, how uh, are, let's see, how are you? <laughs> it's, it's like, how are you? And put a Y in there. How are you today? <clears throat> so if I say, how are you today? And I just, and I just say the same thing again and again and repeat it in the same way, you will stay over here. So what I need to do is give you naturally varied review. I need to change this in some way, the same thing I'm doing with changing these examples here. This is called naturally varied review, where I take something, I don't just repeat one thing again and again and hope you understand it, I really need to make it clear in Japanese that, that this is what I'm teaching. This is red, this is blue, this is black, okay? And so in the same way, uh, I want to just as a teacher focus on one part of this speech, so I keep the phrase the same, how are you today, <clears throat> but then I start increasing the speed. Pardon me, <clears throat> so I get some water. I'm getting an early drink. Ah. So again, what we want to do is go from the slower speed over here to something faster. So I'm going to take the same phrase, how are you today? And I want to get a little bit faster each time. And each time you'll hear the blending a little bit more. How are you today? 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 So I'm going through those and I might say that like when I meet meet my friends I'm like, "Oh, how are you today?" You know, "How are you?" 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 And so as you hear those, then it becomes easier when you just hear the faster version, you are prepared for that. All right. Does this make sense? So if you're trying to learn these things by yourself, uh, it's a bit more difficult to do if you don't have someone to give you examples. Uh, but one way to get this is through something like Uglish, which uh, like Uglish.com, uh, where if you know a particular phrase, you're looking for a particular example of phrase, then you can hear that again and again. You can look for this in Google uh, or YouTube as well, but Uglish will give you specific examples. It will search these things out. Uh, and so you can listen to that. Uh, not only will it give you, uh, I don't know if you can search like for different speeds of things, but at least you can, you can still look at like English versions that are uh, a particular phrase. So you know what the phrase is, but then you hear it in these different examples. Okay. And so again, the point is, if you're only learning this, you're not getting enough varied examples or enough real examples that you're going to become a good, uh, like a good, a good speaker or a good understander uh, of the language. All right. So remember, we want to move from here over to here, but it's much easier to do this in understandable steps. So that's why in Fluent for Life, uh, my program, we organize the language in the same way. So we try to take things slow at first, help you understand things, and then you get to see how they sound in a real conversation. All right, so it's much easier. Often I ask uh, students like, hey, why don't you watch the conversation first uh, and then go back and you can listen to the conversation after you have uh, gone through the steps and they can notice a lot of progress because they understand a lot more. All right, so remember, uh, there, there are different things about like learning English as a uh, second language versus learning English as a first language, but this is something very simple that you can do by yourself if you want to, uh, and you really move from here to here by getting naturally varied review. So you need to get varied examples of things, and that way you can just focus on, on kind of controlling one part of the language, like uh, whatever the particular vocabulary it is you're learning. So it's the same vocabulary, but instead of just repeating it again and again, you're getting lots of varied examples like this. And so maybe some are slower and easier, some are a little bit faster. And you know, like if you're going through Uglish or something like that, you might, you know, it might not play them in this order for you. Uh, but you will still get examples like this. And after you get enough examples, it becomes much easier to move from here to over here. All right. 
So it is possible to go from this side of understanding to this side of understanding, and this is how you do it, all right? So you need to get lots of varied examples that help you understand things like a native, all right? I'll go back and look at comments, uh, but hopefully this makes sense. Uh, this really is the, the core. Uh, so if you're learning like this, but you're not learning like this, then this is going to be difficult. Okay, so if you learn only the textbook stuff, only very clear English, very slow English stuff that's easy to understand, uh, then the real language will be much more difficult for you. So what I recommend uh, is that you actually don't spend a lot of time watching like English language learning videos. You should actually just be looking for things you're interested in in English. Uh, and so the benefit of having someone able to teach you is, like me, I can explain what vocabulary means, but help you understand it like a native, rather than just tell you a definition or a translation that you will probably forget, all right? So uh, as long as you can understand the vocabulary and you know what you're looking for, this is a way for you to do that, all right? Pretty simple. All right, so I'll go back and answer questions, see if anybody has any questions about, uh, let's see about this. All right, I think I got those already. Good morning, Drew from Vietnam. Oh, and I got that one too. The best teacher is here, guys, Allah says. Thanks for, okay, I got those already. All right, hi from Istanbul, hello from Brazil, morning from Egypt, from Thailand. Look at that, people from everywhere. Allah says, are there are the grammar different in movies? Uh, I, for the most part, so for the most part, mostly, uh, the grammar is the same, but what you will hear that's different in a real conversation is sometimes it's incorrect grammar, but everybody uses that because it's faster and easier to say. As an example, uh, here, let me just let me erase. I think everybody's getting this idea. So for example, this is one uh, very simple thing that you will often hear from native speakers in conversations or movies and TV shows. Uh, and this is uh, like there are, uh, let's see, two birds. Uh, let's see, there are two birds over there. Now, how might a native speaker say this sentence, all right? How might a native speaker say this incorrectly? Uh, but uh, again, we're <laughs> like they're speaking it incorrectly, but this is naturally how people speak. So there are two birds over there. I'll give you a second to write that down in the chat, whatever you think that is. How would a native say this? There are two birds over there. There are two birds over there. I'll give you a, mo a moment as I look through the chat, make sure I got everybody here. Uh, all right, so Priscilla says, hi. There's a lovely smiley face there, Saigon Drew. Hey, Drew, are you still in Japan? Uh, yes, how is your daughter? She may grow big now. Yes, I have two daughters, actually, uh, an eight-year-old and a four-year-old, but they are doing well, thank you. Raphael says, hi, Drew, could you please explain what crosses your mind when you hear fight it out versus fight it? Uh, write it out versus write it. Speak it out versus speak it. Uh, I'm almost getting it. Ah, uh, good question. Often this, uh, this extra preposition at the end of things like eat your food versus eat up your food, uh, part of it, I think I talked about this in a, in a recent video, but part of this is just being conversational, uh, but the other part is, is like completeness. So if I tell my children, hey, eat your food, like I could mean like you don't have to eat all of it, like eat some of it. But when I say like eat up, like make sure you eat it, like typically the idea uh, is that you're, you're like eating all of the food. You want to eat everything. So to do something completely. So if I want to, if I'm like fighting something versus fighting something out, these are, these are small differences that don't really, they're not very important. Uh, so sometimes like phrasal verbs, and I can't think of a good example right now, um, like, but actually let me, so for, for, those, for those things like to fight something out versus, or like to talk about something versus talking, talking something out, uh, they can be, they can have slightly different meanings. So as an example, 
Uh, like to talk with someone, I'm just having a conversation, but to talk something out, that's a, like a, a very specific construction where uh, either I'm trying to to plan and organize something and I'm, I'm talking it out. I'm, I'm saying like, well, I want to do this and then I want to do this other thing. So I'm, I'm, I'm like talking out loud. I'm kind of thinking to myself, but I'm also possibly speaking. Um, and I want to make sure that something, uh, like if I have a lot of pieces of information, I want to, I want to organize them or make them more clear. Another idea of talk it out is where, uh, you could have a problem with someone and instead of fighting with them, you're talking it out. So you're, you're having a discussion with them. Okay. I feel like this, or I have this problem. And now we're trying to talk with each other about how to solve that. So that's to talk something out. So often, uh, in conversations, it's, it's difficult, uh, or I guess in conversations, it's easier to understand what the person means by particular vocabulary. And that's because vocabulary by itself doesn't mean anything. Uh, usually vocabulary will have multiple meanings, like the example I just gave about talking something out. Uh, so if I'm talking out, like, like if I, if I just read the words talk out, you, you don't really know exactly what I mean. So it's, it's really the, the situation that will help you understand that. So whenever you see that particular vocabulary, try to get more examples of that, but from the same situation. Uh, and once you understand how it works in that situation, you might also get additional examples. So this is the kind of thing we do in Fluent for Life where we wanna show you, uh, like I do even in these videos here. So we have particular vocabulary, but it doesn't mean anything unless it's in a situation. So the vocabulary, even a single word like bark or date or trunk or something like that, it can have a very different meaning depending on the situation. So that's a very good question, uh, but it's better rather than to look at like the vocabulary by itself, uh, just to pay attention to how natives are doing it. And the more examples you get, the easier it is for you to understand. All right, uh, let's see. Gabriel says, I can easily understand English from the hoods, bruh, when with a bunch of KKKs over there. Now you would just say hood in general if you're just talking about the hood, uh, unless you mean like multiple hoods, <laughs> but we would just say hood in general. I have a good level of listening. Uh, is, how are, is how are you doing formal or informal uh, to say in an interview? Well, it would be informal because the grammar is, is like, it's, it's less formal than how are you doing? So if I just say, hey, how are you doing? How are you doing? I would typically say in an interview, how are you doing? How are you doing is a bit more ca casual conversational. Uh, let's see, and I can speak with these. Well, Gabriel is in the wrong place right now. Gabriel, why are you here? <laughs> your English, it's, it sounds like your English is great already. Uh, you says, good morning, I teach. I am following in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. Good job. Well, it's my pleasure. Uh, let's see, Bridget says, uh, how are you, Drew? I'm doing well. Let's see. Yes, but Gabriel's got the right idea. So everything he watches is in English, and that's why, you know, presumably he's becoming a better speaker. So he's getting lots of this naturally varied review. All right, and this is, uh, let's see, Anna from, well, I don't see where you're from, but hello. I'm Martha from Venezuela. Nils, I feel like I'm a lost cause. Please adopt me. Nils, how old are you? Aren't you like 50-something? <laughs> you, you can adopt me, maybe. <laughs> There must be some, uh, some, like, some people in Wisconsin, though, a lot of friendly people who could adopt you over there. Canal says, from Brazil. Hi, mate. Good afternoon from New Zealand. Wow, oh, look at that. New Zealand. Ah, uh, Filipina from Japan. Oh, you're in Japan also. Two birds there, I guess. Let's see. Anonymous. Hi, Drew. It's nice to be with you live. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Anonymous with a, looks like a crying cat face. <laughs> Yeah, 52. And so, yeah, it's, maybe I could adopt you. I don't know how that would work, but uh, I don't know. Put yourself in a box and, and send yourself to Japan. <laughs> All right, so watch this carefully, uh, and you'll understand why I do this. Let me look at this sentence very quickly, because this is something you will hear a lot if you're listening for it. So there are two birds over there. Making sure I'm not covering this over here. There are two birds over there. Now, this will often be shortened, too. There's, there's two birds over there. There's two birds over there. Now, I want to be clear, this is incorrect English. You would probably not want to write this on your job interview application or whatever. Uh, if you're writing for business, there's two birds. This is a uh, very basic and very incorrect English, uh, but natives use it all the time. 
And this is why it's important to understand the, the kind of textbook stuff, to know the rules, but also to understand how the rules can be broken in real conversations. And so this is one example of that where we're actually taking something incorrect just because it's easier to say. So listen to the difference here. I'll put the correct thing back up again. There are. Now I'm going to speak it slowly at first and then get a little bit faster. There are two birds over there. 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 And right here, this is where the, like I, it, it becomes a bit more difficult for me to speak. Uh, there are, there are, there are, this, this blend here, because the sounds are, are quite different. There are, there are, and that's why you will, you will sometimes hear this contracted as like, uh, we'll just write it up here, there. So this is also not correct English, but you will hear people speaking like this, there, 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 there. But the fastest way of all is theirs, theirs theirs. And it doesn't matter if, if it's incorrect because natives understand what we're talking about. So we're talking about multiple things, two things. There's two birds over there. There's two birds over there. There's two birds over there. So when you're learning the language, you have to pay attention. Again, you want to connect the vocabulary with the situation. All right. The, the vocabulary by itself doesn't really mean anything. It's only the vocabulary in a situation. And when you can think like that, then you're thinking like a native speaker. So the, the correct way is there are and the contracted way, which is not correct, but people will still speak that way. They're, they're trying to speak faster, but still sound correct is there, 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 there. And then the fastest way is just theirs. There's, there's two birds over there. There's two, there's two, there's two, there's two. There are two, there are two, all right? So you can hear the difference. Uh, and even small things like this in a conversation, this is why people shorten their speech. They want to, number one, communicate more quickly, uh, but number two, uh, typically they're thinking about how we can connect with other people and show that we are part of a group. So a non-native will say, oh look, there are two birds over there. And everyone who's a native will know, ah, that person is not a native speaker, even because they're, they're speaking correctly and they sound correct, but they, there's like something unnatural about that, even though it's correct, all right? So this is why you have to pay attention. You don't focus on the vocabulary, you focus on the situation first. What are natives saying in that situation? So if I see something, I say, hey, like there, there's a group over there. There's a group or there's, uh, there's, uh, there's, two, there's two people over there. There's two people over there. So one of those is correct and one of them is not. But uh, in both cases, I'm using the same theirs. All right. So uh, again, this is just one example about how you might find incorrect grammar, but it's not, think about it as more what is appropriate for the situation rather than like what is the, what is the actual correct grammar. So one of the things that I, I mentioned earlier about moving from the English as a first language approach to learning English as a, or moving from English as a second language, excuse me, to learning English as a first language is just focusing on the vocabulary, all right? So we can take something, uh, we have a clear example of something and then we hear how natives might say it uh, faster. But another example of naturally varied review is where we have a situation and then how do natives say that differently? So it's the same situation. They're all talking about two birds over there, uh, but how might people say that differently and what are the reasons for that? So the more you understand it like a native, the more you will think like a native and you will use the right thing at the right time. Also, uh, you will be able to think of multiple ways of expressing something just like this. So there are three different ways of expressing this idea and they're all correct for the situation. But uh, there are is the only one you would want to write, all right? So you learn just more nuances as you get deeper into the language and become more fluent, but you can learn these quite quickly if you learn English as a first language. All right, hopefully uh, people are still following what's going on over there. All right, uh, Twee says, hi from Vietnam. I would like to use your program month by month because the fee for whole package pay one time is big for me. Is it acceptable, teacher? Uh, just save your money. 
Uh, or uh, I think you can, like you can join with PayPal and then when you check the PayPal option, there's like a pay, like pay over time option, I think. Uh, so just you, if you're talking about Fluent for Life, then, then you should be able to do that. So just click uh, when you get to the checkout page, click for PayPal. There should be a link there and then you should be able to choose like pay now or pay over time, something like that. All right. uh, but you can send us an email if you can't find that. Hi, Drew, what does it mean to pull it off? What does pull it off mean? All right. So now this is another example of asking about specific vocabulary like pull off. And when people say, what does pull off mean? The answer I'm going to give is, it depends, okay? Remember, we don't begin with vocabulary. We, I mean, sometimes we do, like you hear a word and you want to understand, but really you need to connect that vocabulary with some kind of situation. So what is the situation you, you heard that in? So one example is, like if I have a, a Band-Aid or like something stuck on my arm and I pull it off. Okay, so that's one physical example of to remove something by pulling. All right, so I'm taking off something or I'm pulling off. Okay, so usually I take off my hat. It's just easy to remove it. So it's like, you know, just take off. Uh, but even something like this, I can take off the cap of this marker, but I can also, I'm also pulling it. So I could pull off the cap. You know, you could use either of those. Remember, there are usually multiple ways to express something. Take off the cap, pull off the cap, or just open up the marker. All right, so another meaning, which is a, a different situation, is to be able to do something. So let's say I've been practicing, uh, I have a special trick where I can take, uh, here watch, I'll do a magic trick for you. Let's see if I can pull it off. Let's see if I can pull it off, all right? Now, pull it, pulling it off means to accomplish it successfully. Are you ready? Watch this. All right, so I'm gonna take my eyeball out. I'm going to put it in my mouth, uh, and we'll see if I can pull this off. Okay, here we go. Ah! I pulled it off. Look at that, okay? So again, to pull something off in this situation means to do something successfully. So uh, typically it's, it's something difficult like, uh, let's say, another use of this same situation for pulling something off. If I'm riding my bike uh, and I have to, let's say I have to go over some kind of like little jump like this. So I'm riding my bike. So this is me, I'm going this way and I have to jump over this little, this little like a gap in the in the road here. So if I jump over this, maybe that's not it's not that big of a deal. It's a pretty small gap, uh, and it's easy to pull that off. So I can pull that off easily. I can do that easily. All right. But it's a it's more difficult. Like if the gap is this far, and now I need to get all the way over here. All right. So this is more difficult uh, to pull off the trick. So often people will talk about pulling something off when there's some kind of difficulty included in that. So you notice here what I'm doing is I'm giving you the vocabulary, but connecting it with situations. All right. So it's not just like, what does the vocabulary mean? It's when do you use it? Okay. So if I'm uh, like that short jump over here, you don't really use pull off for that because it's easy to do. Like, hey, I... I, uh, I put my shirt on this morning. Wow, you really like did something amazing putting on your shirt. It's, nobody would say, wow, you really pulled off something amazing doing that. But if I ride my bike and jump over a, a school bus or something, then I pulled off something pretty cool. Okay. So remember, uh, I know you, you usually begin with vocabulary, but typically the vocabulary, you heard that or you saw it in some situation. So really try to think about that first. Uh, before you just like think about the vocabulary by itself because vocabulary is always connected to some situation. So even the same vocabulary, it could be uh, a completely different meaning depending on uh, what the situation is. So remember that. <clears throat> All right, uh, Sita again, I see there. Brazil is in the house. Yes, actually we've got quite a few Brazilians in the house. Today. Anonymous, can you explain to me how does how you learn is how you speak. Can you explain to me how does how you learn English is how you speak? I'm guessing you mean what does that mean? Uh, this just means the way you learn becomes or is the way you speak. 
So if I practice learning by, by repeating something, and this is just one example, and remember, there are, there are many different pieces of learning English as a first language or learning English as a second language. But as I, as I talked before about like one of these things is just repeating vocabulary. So let's say I hear uh, an expression, whatever that expression is, and I just repeat that again and again. Or I'm listening to some audio uh, example and it's just repeating the exact same thing in the exact same way from the same speaker again and again. Very quickly, I will get used to that speaker. That's why many people watching my videos, they are used to the sound of my voice. All right, so even there, I just said used to the sound of my voice. So I'm actually adding extra sounds. I'm, I'm speaking in a way that I would not normally say. If I'm speaking with natives, I would just say like the way I used to do it, 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 all right? But uh, again, the E, SL approach, so English as a second language, part of this is just rote repetition, where we're going to take one thing or whatever and just repeat it again and again, all right? But there are one, many problems with this, uh, but the biggest problem is it doesn't prepare you for real life communication. So as an example, here's a greeting. We'll just say the greeting is hello. I've covered this example before. So if we say hello, and you learn in, in a class and everybody stands up, you say, hello, teacher, and the, te and the teacher says, hello, to the students. But when you get into the real world, you've got actually many different examples. So it's not just hello that you repeat over and over again. You get many different examples like, hey, how's it going? How are you? Where you been? How's the family? How's everybody doing? What are you up to? Okay, so I'm, I'm giving you very quickly a bunch of different examples. They're both greetings for the same situation, but notice that, again, the vocabulary is different. And so that's just one difference between learning English as a second language and learning English as a first language. And so not only is the vocabulary different, but you might have different speakers say the vocabulary different. So one thing is like, hey, and so I, like, I might hear even the word hey, like H-E-Y, the casual hey, it's like hello. Someone might say hey. Someone might say hey, you know, like hey girl, you know, something like that. It you know, depends on where you live. Uh, but you will hear different people speak in different ways. And so what you need to do is not repeat the same thing. It's good to get maybe like two or three examples of the same thing from the same person. But then you need to hear different examples from different people to really prepare you for real life. So the situation is the same, but you can see how this is much more limited and it doesn't prepare you for real communication. So if you learn like this, you will be prepared for this. If you learn like this, you will not be prepared for this, okay? So this is what I mean by how you learn is how you speak. So if you learn like this, if you learn English as a first language, the same way natives do, you will be prepared for real conversations. But if you learn English as a second language through your native language by studying textbooks and grammar rules and that kind of thing, uh, and again, it's important to understand grammar, it's just how do you do that? Do you understand it as a first language? Do you understand it intuitively, like by seeing something, by really understanding it? Or are you trying to think about rules and translate vocabulary in your head? Okay, so again, that's how we would uh, like answer, answer your question about that, about like the different ways of learning. But in, in, in general, how you learn is how you speak. All right, so that's the, uh, the basic idea there. Uh, I'm subscribers to YouTube channel, glad to hear it. Abu Hay, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Nils would try it, all right. Uh, uh, how to use does to a third person. Anna, what do you mean by that? Give me an example. What, what's, what specific sentence are you trying to say? Remember, don't think about the vocabulary, think about the situation. Uh, Sahimon, I want to be a, I want to be a customer, sir. Oh, you mean like customer service representative. What is your advice about that job call center? I'm from Panama, blessings. Uh, well, I would look for people who are in that job. I'm sure you can find uh, people on YouTube talking about customer service. I mean, we do customer service for what we do, like helping learners, you know, answering questions and uh, fulfillment and all of that stuff. But I'm sure you can find specific things uh, for your for your situation or for your particular job. I would look on YouTube or talk to other people who do that, though. 
Uh, let's see, XDL. We don't have PayPal. You know, CCP even. I want to buy a card, but don't have no rights, no admission. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, so it can be tricky when you're like in a country that doesn't allow credit cards or something like that. Um, I would try to use a VPN or get someone else to pay because we do have people from China and other countries who do join our program. I don't know how they do it. Uh, and they get Frederick as well. A lot, a lot of people from China download Frederick. Um, that's our other app you can get in the description below this video. Um, but the, yes, I, I, unfortunately, there's not really much we can do about that. But hopefully uh, you can find someone who can help you and maybe you can pay cash and they can buy it for you. Lots of people do that for our programs as well. Ahmed says, thank you. And Olympia says, uh, K -K 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 -K. <laughs> I like the different, the different writing for people laughing. So in America, it's like LOL, but a lot of people write like a KKKKK for the... <laughs> for the laughing stuff love block uh love from china i always get lost when listening to native speakers it's like my brain automatically filters some words any suggestions yes so again like you you have to you have to move in steps from here to here so just pick a specific thing uh whatever is easiest for you or whatever is most important for your life and focus on that one thing so what we do in Fluent for Life is we want to have you focus on a particular topic for a month because it really takes the brain that long to get used to things, to develop a good habit, to hear things again and again in different ways, uh, to really feel confident about using things. And so whatever that is, uh, if you have trouble understanding natives, uh, think about understanding natives for a particular topic whatever that topic is. So if I want to learn about, I don't know, raising pet hamsters. So I would go watch YouTube videos about that particular topic and just watch different native speakers talking about that. And to make it a little bit slower or a little bit easier, maybe I'm watching a video for children about how to raise a hamster. So it might be uh, like simpler vocabulary, slower, or it might be more clear. Uh, I think I mentioned this again on a previous video or in a previous video, uh, but there are videos I have done about how to describe something in different ways, like a simple and intermediate and more advanced ways to describe something. I can do another example of that in this video if you'd like, um, but you can also find that I think maybe Wired Magazine uh, has like a series like that on YouTube where they have a person explaining a topic to five different levels of people and so that's a good example of naturally varied review where you have one person focused on a particular topic but they're explaining it in different ways so you have how would you explain something to a child or to a, like an elementary school kid or a graduate student or something like that so these are all uh, really good ways for you to do that but that's that that step-by-step that -step process I was explaining before. This is what we do in Fluent for Life. So we want to take you from understanding teachers to understanding native speakers, and that's how we do it. So we want to move you in steps, and then you need to hear lots of different examples to be prepared uh, for native communication. All right, that's how you do it, though. All right, uh, Sheila, uh, following, following keenly, I am a Kenyan in the United States. Welcome. Amir, what is the meaning of overwhelmed? Uh, well, it just means you're, you know, something is, is like happening to you too much. Like if I'm, if I'm speaking really quickly and I'm not blending my words in a, like an easy to understand way, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm just like giving you a lot of information, I'm overwhelming you with information. Or if you have a bunch of ants coming and swarming you all at the same time, you can be overwhelmed by that. But rather than ask me questions about specific vocabulary like this, like type in overwhelmed in Google, like do a Google image search or do a Google or YouTube search and you will find lots of examples that will help you understand these things like a native. So I don't want you to get a definition. I want you to understand the vocabulary the same way a native does. So when you learn new vocabulary in your native language, you have to integrate that. You have to understand it the same way a native does, uh, and that's where you can use it confidently. So if you still have to think about translations or something in your head when you speak, then you won't communicate fluently. So you really need to get lots of good examples of things to help you understand them like a native. 
Uh, let's see, I don't have a PayPal account. How to start uh, with trial account or paid month by month. Yeah, I would just ask someone you know who has a PayPal account or a credit card and just, yeah, just ask them to do it as well. I think even within PayPal, you can use a, a credit card if you want to do that too. Um, so, but I think, yeah, lots of people in Vietnam have uh, credit cards. Let's see, keep calm. Hello from Ukraine. Your lessons uh, is very helpful. Keep going, teacher. So again, you'd say your lessons are very helpful. Your lessons are very helpful. It's my pleasure. Glad to hear it. Drew, the situation was about TLW political candidates fighting to win a swing state TLW political candidates. I don't know what that means. Let's see. Uh, so they were fighting it out. Ah, yeah. So again, like in that situation, you could be fighting or fighting it out. It's just like again, like usually a longer, a longer fight or there's some kind of discussion, but typically for that specific situation, uh, you might have a group of people fighting for, you know, like who's going to win a political, uh, like a political race or something like that. Uh, let's see, by the way, I could type the whole thing up uh, before because of word limit, but it got through. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, there's a word limit on these, uh, on these chats. That's interesting. Uh, Ildar, nice to see you there. How's it going? You'd say, how's it going, Drew? Thank you very much. Uh, what does attempt mean, Drew? Uh, I will let you look that up. Uh, looking up again, like uh, my, I'm, I am of best help to people on this, uh, on this channel and on these videos and even in our programs. Um, obviously, I, I teach a lot of vocabulary, but I really want to help you understand something like a native. So rather than like look for like what is the meaning of this word, you again want to connect it with a situation. And that means you should go look up lots of different examples and see what you get. And that will help you synthesize all these different examples and get the, the kind of core understanding of what vocabulary means. So give that a try. Yes, Iran says yes, chemistry, etc. <clears throat> Uh, let's see, Anna, I, if I am talking to someone, but I want to ask them, actually, this does thing is for my kids. He asked me how to use it, but I'm totally no idea how to explain it in Japanese. I don't know what yours well, was. I think that was about like the, the pretend, like some, is this a question about Japanese or English? Are you trying to explain something to a Japanese person, maybe? Adrian, I'm a Spanish speaker, but sometimes it is difficult for me to reproduce some sounds. Yeah, any advice? Feel frustrated and stuck for not improving. Uh, Adrian, get Frederick if you have not getting, uh, gotten that already. Just click on the link in the description below this video. It will take you through all the phonetic sounds of English, and you can learn how to pronounce them the same way natives do in steps. Like you notice everything we do is in simple steps to make sure you know exactly where you're getting, uh, getting stuck. Peter Griffin from Family Guy. Oh, a dollar. <laughs> uh, sorry, it was a typo. I meant two candidates. My bad. No, it's okay. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Like when, when you're like fighting or fighting it out, in that case, there's no difference between those. What is TL? TL uh, it, that, that's what you, you meant by two. Oh, okay. Uh, I spoke soda as a Chinese. I have the same pronunciation problem. For example, lift left, close, close. Yeah, this is why we get a lot of Chinese people uh, get Frederick. <laughs> so Frederick, very quickly, for people who do not know what that is, usually when people are learning pronunciation, they're trying to learn English pronunciation, uh, like especially if you have a, a pronunciation coach, so someone is listening to you, you will hear a word, uh, like those words over there, like close, uh, let's see, see what, or you have close. So this one, like sometimes you will hear this as a, like the TH sound is a little bit in there, like clothes, clothes, oh, it's like a little bit, but most people just pronounce it quickly as clothes. And people can understand uh, what you're talking about from the context. So if I say, yeah, I'm going to the clothes store, like they, they mean like that close, not this kind of close over here. All right. Uh, and so when you're learning pronunciation, typically you will just get a word and then you will uh, maybe you will either compare it with another word or you will just repeat after a teacher. But what we want to do is actually help you understand the vocabulary and the pronunciation of words in the regular steps that natives learn them. So you would begin with something like, as an example, uh, a short consonant, vowel consonant word like cat. So we learn the individual sounds for these, for this word, k, a, t, cat, k, 
cat. So this is a short vowel sound, ah. But rather than you like trying to remember the names of these sounds, like digraph or short vowel or long vowel, whatever, uh, little kids, they, some of them know that, but a lot of them don't. Uh, and they just know that's the sound. Like this is cat, and then if we change this letter over here, we got uh, like fat or hat or bat or sat or mat. And by hearing those, we can isolate the particular sound, just listen to what is different, and it's much easier to teach ourselves the pronunciations of words, all right? And so we do this, uh, Frederick allows you to do this, and it's going to take you up through all the levels of phonics. And this is nowhere else on the internet. No app does this either. Uh, there will, there are like phonics apps, but they only teach like a kind of, like maybe uh, a, a few levels of phonics, but we go through everything. So there are over 2000 words and sentences in the app. And so it will take you from, again, learning something simple like cat to Kate. So when we have this E over here, the A pronunciation changes. It becomes a long A sound. But I don't want to teach you that. I want you to discover how that works by playing with the app. Because when you play with the app, you're like, oh, look at that. Huh, that's interesting. And it's teaching yourself, which is really the highest form of education. So if you can understand something by yourself, that's why we made the app. So rather than getting like a lecture from me about it, you want to learn pronunciation, be able to teach yourself as fast as possible, but this is how you do it. So you go from cat to Kate to something longer like educate, all right? And then you learn, oh, look at that. Like it's the same kinds of uh, things that we can learn, but we learn them in the right steps. So you can control the learning, you learn it in the right steps, and that's how you can learn pronunciation and improve your listening at the same time. So definitely highly recommend the app. It's like very cheap for what it does. If you were to take a, uh, like a regular pronunciation class, I mean, that could cost like hundreds of dollars or more, but you get basically me in an app and I'm teaching you everything, but you get to discover how it works. So it took us a long time to build it. Please download it uh, and use it. It will help you improve. Uh, let's see. What is the difference between start and start off? Uh, yeah, there's no, no difference for that. Four, uh, where we're just talking about beginning something. Like, I want to start this meeting uh, by saying hello. I want to start off this meeting by saying hello. There's no, no difference there. Yes, I am sure. Okay, I think you guys are speaking to each other. Kevin Diaz, closed store, closed store. What uh, would be the difference when pronouncing that? Well, if you're talking about like a closed store, the store is closed, that's a different sound than close. So clo like, like actual close, like I gave like these two words, they can sound the same in a regular conversation. So a close store and the store is like, if we just talk about open and close, that's the same sound. But sometimes people will pronounce like usually a slightly more educated, uh, like a higher class of speaker will like, they will say like clothes, clothes. There will be that little TH sound in there, but often like irregular people just say clothes. Or you might even say clothing, clothing store, a clothes store. I need to buy some clothes. I need some new clothes. I need, new, need some new clothes. But if you want to hear all those things, like we've got words like this and, you know, where you're learning words like leak and leak. So leak, this is a vegetable. And leak, this means there's like some liquid or something coming out of something else. So it's a different word with the same sound. So different spelling as well. It's a homonym. Uh, situation, uh, you can get clothes or clothes in different situations. Yeah. Uh, started to begin with something to start off is the way I started. Uh, that's not necessarily true, but remember, it's important uh, to think to not think about what vocabulary means. It just what does vocabulary mean for a situation? So again, like when when people like it, it, like you don't want to argue about like what does the word truck mean. So people think, oh, a truck is, you know, is like a big car or whatever. But yeah, it's, it, like it does mean that, but it also means to carry something. Like, well, I have to truck my backpack around with me. And so people hear that, like a non-native speaker, and like, oh, you just said truck for carrying something around. And so again, I'm connecting the word truck to the activity or the situation of me carrying something. And so now you've understood it more like a native. All right. So I have to truck my bags all over, all over town. I have to carry them with me, okay? 
So it's important, remember that when you're learning vocabulary, the ultimate judge is, is what situation are you talking about? Uh, hottest or scalding? I don't know, is that for me? I don't know, I don't know if that's, uh, oh, you're trying to explain that for like to a Japanese person or something? Well, I mean, like if you're, if you're talking about something being scalding, uh, scalding doesn't necessarily mean the hottest. It just means like it's, it's really hot and it could burn you. That's what scalding means. So the hottest could actually be hotter than scalding, like whatever, I don't know what, the, whatever the, the imaginary hottest temperature uh, something, something is. Uh, Amber says, in your opinion, which is more useful to get handy vocabulary, Oxford bookworm? You mean bookworm? I don't know. I don't know what Oxford, Oxford bookworm or bookworm is, uh, or four thousand essential English words, uh, or essential words in English. Okay, uh, I don't know what your what your goal is. So for getting a handy vocabulary, I, don't, I probably wouldn't do either of those things if I'm trying to learn. So if I'm trying to learn a language, I don't want just like a, a textbook of a whole bunch of vocabulary. I want to understand situations. And so I want to begin, this is how I finally got fluent in, in, uh, in Japanese. So I've probably told this story before, but when we get from, uh, or when I, when I arrived in Japan, I spent almost a year so let's just say this is like one year over here, my first year in Japan, uh, where I was just studying textbooks and trying to, and I was trying to be a good student. And I thought I would become fluent because I was in Japan, because everybody knows, right? Everybody knows immersion is the thing you need to become fluent. But I didn't become fluent, and so immersion was not the thing that got me fluent. All right, what happened is that like I finally discovered that I needed to learn Japanese as a first language. Okay, I needed to learn it as a first language the same way native, native children do, or the, really the same way uh, everybody learns their native language. It doesn't matter how old you are. And so from that point, I began looking at situations. So I stopped trying to begin with vocabulary like this. Like I would look in a textbook and it says like, here's a grammar point and it might give like two or three examples. But this way of learning is kind of backwards. Really, you want to begin with a situation and think, what do people use for that? Because you can actually, as an example for grammar, uh, there might be one situation that you could express even with different, different grammar points. All right, like we talked about, you know, like one uh, even just basic vocabulary example. So I could be talking about like take off the cap or I could say remove the cap. So those are two different definitions uh, or two different ways of, of describing this situation. So the situation is this. How do we describe that? I'm taking off the cap, I'm removing the cap, I'm pulling off the cap. I want to disconnect the cap from the marker. So I'm learning the grammar by learning uh, the situation. And so once I started doing this, like I don't want to just get a, uh, like a book of random vocabulary, even if that vocabulary is used frequently, it's much better to focus on a particular situation that's important for my life. So in my case, when I was coming to Japan, like part of it was just every day, like how do I, how do I talk about things at the grocery store? Or for me learning Japanese gardening, how do I talk with people about specific things? And so I learned vocabulary that most people, even Japanese people, don't know because it's, it's specific for that, for that industry. Um, and so I'm learning these things and I begin with a situation and then I hear how different people talk about that thing. And as I hear like, like one thing, just a basic greeting, like I, I talked about before, about saying hello, like I remember uh, one of the first greetings that I learned in, in, ja in Japanese is like konnichiwa, uh, but you also hear like ohayou gozaimasu. And I, I heard that like a lot, especially from young kids. So like a little little kids when they're when they're they they start they're like elementary school and they start getting up into into high school, like especially boys they're not speaking very clearly they're just like us us you know and, and like that's like a way of greeting people that was not in my textbook, and I could understand what they were saying because I was looking at the situation I was like okay they're addressing me they're greeting me they're not talking about you know buying new shoes or something they're just saying hello but this is just a different way of doing that 
So usually what people are doing is they're, they think of like one way to say something. So they learn maybe one word in their native language and then they try to connect that with a word in English. Well, you don't want to do that. You want to look at a situation and think what do people say in this situation, all right? This is why I keep going back and, and trying to encourage you, uh, trying to recommend to you to not, not like find vocabulary and get a definition for it, but just think like when is the situation someone might be using that? And then spend more time with that situation. So I, I made a video as an example of this, uh, that kind of naturally varied review about how to make espresso. So if you've not seen that video already, uh, I recommend you go watch that video on my channel. It's just how to make espresso. Uh, but it gives four different people talking about that. And so how you would make espresso and a lot of the vocabulary is the same, but some vocabulary is different. Uh, and then you would also hear different pronunciation or, you know, there's some that, that varied variability, but yes, uh, around the, the context uh, is important for that. And so understanding what, what, your, what the situation is, like understand the situation first. So even if I don't know any language, if I, if I, if I come to Japan and see like a, a marker or something falls on somebody's head and that person gets hurt, that is the situation, even if I don't speak any, any language at all. And so I hear them say something and I think, ah, that probably means this is what you say when you get hurt. And if I see more examples of that, then I will really feel confident about that. Oh, this, I guess that's really what you say. And then I hear maybe some different examples of that too. So depending on how, how bad it is, it's like, like one Japanese person might be like, eat top. Or, some, or like a little kid is like, Itai! you know, like something like that. Uh, or like a, an older guy's like, Kso! you know, he's like, fuck, you know, it's, it's something really hurt. And so I'm not looking at, at just the vocabulary by itself. The context is the most important part, and that's how you learn uh, like a native. Uh, all right, let's see here. Road closed, not closed road. Uh, you, could, you could hear both of those. Like, is the, is the road closed or is that a, a, a closed road? You, you could hear both of those. Uh, scolding is when it comes... When it comes water, uh, well, you could be you could be scalded by by lots of things. I suppose you. I don't. I don't know if you can only be scalded by water. Um, you could be scalded by hot metal or something else. I don't know. Look it up. Look at what are the situations where you're scalded, and it's kind of going in the reverse way where you look at the vocabulary and look at like, okay, how do I understand this better? What specific situations? Uh, in, in, in which like I could be scalded. So could I only be scalded from water? Is that vocabulary specific to water or, or could I also be scalded from something else? I bet you will find uh, more than just water if you look that up. Uh, let's see, appreciate it, says Anna. Okay, thank you so much, teacher. We are learning a lot from you, I'm glad to hear. All right, uh, koniji, ah, is that Japanese? Or are you trying to write, let's see, koniji wa wada. She wa el daso do dozo yoroshiku. Ah, dozo yoroshiku no gaishimasu ne. Ah, okay, so because you're Chinese, you're using like the, like the, the different way of writing that. I gotcha. So that's even different from uh, nomaji for, for saying that in English. Is there any good show or podcast when it comes to studying English? Uh, I, I would not worry about, like for what I do for Fluent for Life, I just have people go through the program, and if they want to supplement that with more information, I would just recommend go to YouTube and learn more about those particular topics. So uh, the podcast is not about learning English for, your, for the answer to your question, um, but it would be a podcast about something you're interested in. It's just in English. So there is a, when I was younger, I don't know if it's still around, but when I was younger, there was a, a uh, like a kind of a, a radio show, maybe it's a podcast now, called Car Talk. Uh, and so they would just be like these two guys talking about different cars and it would, it would be a call-in show. So people, I think they could call and ask questions about cars and things like that. Um, but that's the kind of thing you would be, uh, you would be looking for. So rather than like a studying English podcast. I, like you don't, you don't need to spend a lot of time. Now that you know how to learn, just apply that to, to learning English. So I don't listen to any podcasts for like learning Japanese. It's more about 
like here's a podcast about something in that's it's just in Japanese, but it's a topic I'm interested in. Yes, thank you for uh, Olympia over there always reminding me uh, about water. You're like my mom, you know. Like, drink some water. Drink some water. <laughs> uh, do you have any podcasts to listen to? Uh, I do. Um, if, if you want to, like, we have a podcast on, uh, it's old. I mean, I haven't updated in a while. Uh, but you can find that here on the YouTube channel. Just click on the podcast tab on our channel, I think. Or you can find those videos. Um, but, again, like, you really want to make it real for you rather than just trying to listen to like English lessons or whatever. So what we do in the podcast is I'm typically talking about like ways of learning, like strategies to get fluent faster. Um, but once you understand how to learn, you just want to apply that to different things. So you can learn more about particular things in English the same way you learn about them in uh, whatever your native language is. Raph, hello from Poland. Let's see, Anna, is that a uh, homophone? Yeah, so if you have something that is the, uh, like the same, uh, same sound, but a different word. Uh, Aubrey says, hello from Korea. Hello, nice to see you there. Let's see, hello, is it a life lesson? Now that's gonna be different from a live lesson. A life lesson, if you don't know what that is. So a life with an F over a life lesson, this is where I'm teaching you something that's like valuable information for your life. But a live lesson is just happening now. So maybe you're getting both. You're getting a life lesson in a live lesson. All right. Uh, again, a Dehemis. That's an interesting name. Uh, Brazil is in the house. And MBO uh, is looking up on the internet for the meaning of words, the best way to learn English. Uh, typically not. Uh, it's, a, it's a place to start just to understand what words mean if you don't understand what something means. Um, but you, it's better to like to go to Google and do an image search and try to see, especially if it's just a noun uh, or a, a, like an action that you can see what it, is, what it is. So go to Google, do an image search for a word like bridge or lion or travel or something and you'll see lots of examples and all those examples are teaching you it's it's uh, the naturally varied review you get from learning more like a native that way so it's okay to get definitions of words but that's that's really the the, the very beginning of the process and you want to get to uh, the situation and when you're using specific vocabulary uh, and that's what's going to help you understand it like a native so the more uh, examples you get the better you understand something and typically, uh, even if you get just a definition of words, and often you can, you can look at a definition of a word and it will take you to another word and then it go to another word and you go around to all these different words and uh, it's still not really clear what the word means. It's, it's really seeing the situation that helps you understand something. Nice to meet you from Korea. Blut says, uh, nice to see you there. Let's see, uh, Fabricio if I'm pronouncing that correctly, from Brazil in the capital letters over there. What is the best way to check vocabulary in the classroom? If I gave students, uh, I don't know, what, what do you mean by that? What is the best way to check vocabulary in the classroom? Do you mean like to make sure students understand some vocabulary? Or if they're, if I gave students a lot of words. Um, yeah, I don't know, I don't understand your question. Uh, do you mean what, what, like do they understand the vocabulary, or are you talking about something else? Give me more information. Uh, Anna says, can you pronounce this, please? Boatswain? What is that? Boatswain? I, I don't know what that is. Is that a word, boatswain? I've never heard that before. Uh, from S-T-K-I-T-T-S. Pran... Parantu. I don't know what that means. Uh, is that, that's where that's like the name of your like where you're from, where? Andrea, I'm from Brazil as well. I gave students more. Um, yeah, well, I would just just to be um, just to be clear. If I understand your question, uh, it sounds like you want to you want to give them more vocabulary and make sure they understand it. Uh, I would, if, if, if that's what you're asking about, I would, I would try to make, uh, it's okay to give more vocabulary, but it should be around the particular topic that it's easy for them to make a connection. So if I'm teaching about cars, 
then I might be talking about like fixing an engine and different parts of the car or something like that, um, rather than just like something completely different. So I don't know what exactly your question is, but make sure it's easy for them to understand. So that is your job as the teacher, just like me, like as an English fluency guide, I don't want to just, I could, I could write a bunch of vocabulary and just tell you the definitions of things, but that's not going to help you speak fluently, not for most people. Uh, I have to make sure you understand it like a native. You should be thinking, ah, now I understand what that means, and that's when you can feel confident about speaking. Okay. Uh, and M-B-O-E-D again, what are the best strategies for learning English language? This is it. Learn English as a first language. That is the strategy. That's the whole thing. Very simple. Uh, let's see, and that's why I talk about that over and over and over and over again, but I talk about it in different ways. So we're talking about pronunciation or listening or grammar or whatever. Uh, every problem, every issue people have is because they're learning English as a second language through their native language. And so if you're learning English through your native language, then you will think about your native language when you speak. Okay, so how you learn is how you speak. If you think about translations when you learn, you will think about translations when you speak, and then you will get stuck and you will forget the words, and that's what creates all those problems. But if you learn as a native, so you're learning English as a first language, you don't have those problems. You understand pronunciation the same way natives do, and the same thing for vocabulary or grammar or whatever. You're learning all those things the same way. Uh, let's see. If somebody can communicate with teammates in Call of Duty, do you think does he speak fluent English? Game over. <laughs> in Call of Duty 19. Uh, well, I think if you can if you can speak with people in, I'm, I'm sure I haven't played a game like Call of Duty in a long time. But I mean, if it's just like go 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 or whatever, you know, something. If you're or if you're actually speaking on a headset and talking with people. If you can communicate and you get to the goal, then yes, you're communicating and, and you're fluent for that particular situation. All right. Uh, let's see. But sometimes it gets stuck in other situations. Yes. So you can be, as I mentioned earlier, you can be fluent in some vocabulary, but not others. So you don't get fluent in a language. You get fluent in specific vocabulary as you understand that vocabulary. Valentina, could you please help me with the pronunciation of walk and work? Uh, I want to make sure I'm using them correctly. Valentina, get Frederick. Just download the app below this video. Get Frederick, and it's got words like that in it uh, so you can listen to the difference, like walk and talk and, and stalk and all those things. You can hear me. I can pronounce those like hundreds of times for you if you like right in the app. All right, uh, like some idioms I know. Yeah, again, like you, you get fluent word by word or phrase by phrase as you understand that vocabulary. Uh, predator fission again. Please, 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 I understand everything, but my accent is horrible. I don't know what to do. Get Frederick. <laughs> this, this is like the Frederick, uh, the Frederick episode of, uh, of the video series here. Uh, but again, if you want to uh, have a good accent, you need to learn pronunciation the same way natives learn. All right. Remember, how you learn English is how you speak English. So if you learn English with a teacher that's going to give you a, like a thick accent or not help you understand blended pronunciation, then you will sound like that. But if you learn the pronunciation the same way natives learn, then you will speak like a native. Okay. So if you want to get rid of your accent or if you want to just pronounce words, you want to understand the difference between walk and work, uh, then that's what you want with, uh, with Frederick. Get the app. Uh, Dil Noza says, I gave students a lot of words. The next day I checked their vocabulary, giving them Uzbek words, and they translated by writing. I checked their spelling, but doing this all the time, it's boring. Yes, uh, this, is, this is not a way to teach them to speak. If that is your goal, that, that is unlikely to happen. Okay. So remember, like, if often the, the teacher has to do what the school is telling them to do, so the school or the school board or whatever the local government says you need to teach it like this and so you need to give them a bunch of vocabulary words so they can remember it for a test then you just have to do what you have to do i guess um, but if you're trying to help them speak then you should really make something understandable i wouldn't be using any any other languages in a lesson like you know japanese or uzbek or whatever uh, and if you're using translations it means they don't understand 
That's the whole point of a translation because you don't understand what somebody is saying. So you want to, as a teacher, make the language understandable. So that's what I do. Like, and I really I have to I have to think of myself like uh, like a teacher. Uh, you know, like I'm physically there with you and like I'm seeing your face. Do you understand something? Like when I'm teaching in a classroom, I can look at kids or my own children, you know, and, and think, do they understand what I'm saying? And if not, like my, you know, my daughters will look at me with like, no, I don't understand what you're saying, you know. So I have to change what I'm saying. But the point is, I have to make it understandable uh, because if they don't understand, then they can't use that information. All right, uh, let's see, Brian, again, best teacher with a heart. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm here to help you guys. Saying says, sir, how do I overcome the self-correction dilemma? It's like when I talk about some new topic that I've never talked about before, I always find myself self-correcting in my head. I'm at C1. Um, I think the, the fastest way to do that is just to remember that there are multiple ways of saying something. So if you get, if you have almost like a mental issue with that, where you're like, ah, I should have said this, just think, Actually, there are many ways I could have said that. And so you don't have to be, you know, you don't have to be so strict with yourself. Like, oh, I didn't use that one correct thing because there are many correct things you can say. All right. So take the pressure off yourself. You don't have to worry about that. Uh, there are many ways you can express yourself. Uh, and I mean, they, tr let's see, did I... Then I skip that. Oh, okay. Nasir says, hello, sir. It is nice to be in your class again. Can you please discuss something on intonation concerning speech? How important is it while speaking? Well, it's important in that it might change the name or not, not the name, but the meaning of a sentence. Remember that vocabulary depends on the situation. So the intonation can change as well. I was just thinking like, like I have a, uh, like a giant bicycle. So a giant bicycle. And so that would mean like the brand of my uh, bicycle is giant. I have a giant bicycle, but it's like, wow, that's a giant bicycle. That's a giant bicycle. It sounds different. I have a giant bicycle. That's a giant bicycle. <laughs> and so like the, the meaning is, is slightly different, uh, even though the pronunciation is, is pretty similar. But like if you, if you just read those words, you wouldn't notice it. But, but because of the intonation, uh, you do notice a difference. So it's important. And that's the kind of thing, again, that you learn from connecting words with situations. Get Frederick. If you do not have Frederick already, everyone in this chat should have Frederick. It's free to download and it's very cheap if you want to upgrade to the whole thing. Uh, but that will be the fastest way for you to learn uh, and improve your pronunciation all by yourself. Uh, let's see. Uh, I mean, they translate Uzbek into English, but it is boring all the time for the group checking vocabulary. I need uh, competition, com make competition to check vocabulary, so I need advice. Uh, you're looking for a better way to do something boring? Is that, that was, that's what you mean? <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, hmm. Yeah, I guess, I mean, if you can think of a, of a, like a competitive thing, like who can check the most words first or whatever, but see if you can do something fun, like, I don't know, have people look up words online and try to find them on Google or something and look for images. That would be maybe more fun and actually help them learn something. Now it says, how do we learn pronunciation like an A to give us an example? Again, uh, as I mentioned about Frederick, uh, you should download that app. You can get the link to that in the description below that video. But if you want to learn pronunciation like a native, part of that is actually getting the basic steps. So the first thing we want to learn is the alphabet, how to pronounce that. You probably know that already. But then we want to go to the short vowel sounds and then we want to start adding more sounds. And so at each step, you're learning more words and you're understanding the differences between sounds. And so if you can do this by yourself, that's really the highest level of learning, the self-discovery for learning, because then the ideas really stay with you. It's rather than like a teacher telling you what something is, if you discover that for yourself, then you really remember that and think, wow, like this language is really a part of me now. I am an English speaker rather than just like I'm trying to translate something into English, all right? So it's important, that psychology uh, for learning. Uh, and XDL, I gotta find somebody who has a visa uh, supposed to pay by PayPal. Yeah, again, like it doesn't matter if it's a visa or whatever, but yeah. 
But yes, find someone uh, who can help you join the program. I've forgotten many idioms and phrases that I used effectively five years ago, how to keep in my mind what I learned. Well, you got to use it, you know, uh, even if it's just reading, you know, books or something like that or listening to information. Sometimes I forget English words because <laughs> I'm, I'm just in Japan and, and there's some things I don't use. So it happens. Uh, just continue to use those things, exercise it a little bit. So how to make words active all the time uh, so that they use them all the time. Yes, uh, so I answered that in uh, how to speak fluently about almost anything or how to speak uh, in fluent English about almost anything. I forget the exact name of that video. Um, but in that video, uh, I talked about, again, this same idea of learning English as a first language. And if you do that, uh, then you will actually re recall the information much more easily. So if you want to learn quickly and to use the things you know or the things that you learn, uh, you have to learn English as a first language. Hi, teacher. When is your live program time? I don't have a specific time for these. Um, usually they are, I think this month, October, it will be this time, I think, on Thursdays, uh, which is the current time here in Japan. And a teacher, you are handsome, or teacher, you are handsome. Yeah, you could use either of those. That's fine. But thank you if you're if that's talking about me. If or if that's just an example, then uh, <laughs> now I'm embarrassed. Let's see. Saying says, "Got it. Thanks a ton." All right, downloading says Valentina. Very good. Yes, you will enjoy the app. Uh, and remember, Frederick is designed for you to explore the app. So there's not a lot of instruction in it about how to use it, but you can start pushing buttons, start tapping on the different letters, scrolling through things, and you will, you will start figuring out how to use it. It's very simple. Uh, let's see. Yes, subtle stressing says Orion. Orion, Orion, you're, Orion is like a ninja, like, like the, the, the English learning ninja, always there with something, something helpful to say. All right, Aubrey says, I like the way you teach, glad to hear it. Now, the reason people like the way I teach is because I make the language understandable. So I'm trying to help you understand English in English. And each time you learn something in English that way, uh, then you feel more confident and fluent. So the fluency actually improves as you understand more, not as you just study a bunch of words in a textbook, or even as you like repeat words to other people. So as you understand things well, you feel confident about using them, and that's when you can speak. Uh, let's see. Is it possible to is it possible to use idioms in Frederick? Well, like Frederick will Frederick isn't isn't like it's not going to teach you idioms, uh, but it will teach you words that could be used in idioms. So the whole point of the vocabulary is to teach you how pronunciation works, and you will also hear how words blend together in sentences. Amor says, what is the best reference would you recommend us to learn through by using your strategy is by watching TV channels or book stories, especially if I'm not surrounded by people speaking English? Yes. <coughs> Excuse me. You can surround yourself with English speakers just like, like right now. You know, we are not in the same room, but you're getting native input from me. So I'm giving you like the slower, easier to understand examples, but I'm also teaching you some native vocabulary. Um, so there's uh, lots of uh, great things you can find on YouTube like this, but you can get it. Uh, I, I recommend getting varied review as always. So you want to hear some different speakers and you also want to get different media like writing something, reading something, listening, watching. So all those different things. And I would just pick a particular topic. Like if you are not a member of Fluent for Life, but you want to try to do what we do by yourself, just say this month, I'm going to learn about this topic and I'm going to watch a bunch of different people talking about it. I will try to learn that vocabulary by myself. I will hear different people. I will read a little bit. I will write a little bit, watch something. And as you focus on that, just pick something that's useful for your life or some hobby that you have or an interest, whatever that is. Uh, and then that's how you get fluent. So it's not, you don't get fluent from a particular thing, like only videos or only books or whatever. Like for me, part of my, my learning of Japanese, like I have to read and write because I have to, I have to connect the words. Like there's so many words that are the same. Uh, and people often like, they will write like characters on their hands for people when like they're like okay what word are you talking about because it's the same sound but a different word all right and so that's also a way for me to learn the language so it just it's like i don't understand what something means um it's the same thing like when you when you're very young if i if i just show my child uh a bicycle 
So they have, uh, here's like the, the, like the object or whatever, the bike. And my daughter looks at that and I say, oh look, it's a bicycle, bicycle. And they hear the word bicycle from me and from other people. And so they know when they look at that thing, it's a bicycle. But when they get older, they start hearing other words like, like bisect. And it's like, oh, that's interesting. Like bicycle has got two, huh, I wonder if cycle means like circle or wheel or something like that. And so you can hear like the cycle of the seasons, you know, like spring to summer, uh, you know, fall to winter and going back around again like that. So you hear the cycle, it's like, oh, look at that, like bicycle to bisect, like if I've got a circle and I'm gonna cut a line through it, like to bisect something. And so here, this is where you really start going deeper into the language and understanding what words really mean. And it's the same thing, like if I'm studying some, some Japanese characters where like, oh, like I hear a word, I don't really understand what it means. Uh, like I know when I should use it, but like the, the meaning becomes stronger for me when I can see the written character as well. Um, so it depends on your situation, but whatever you need to really understand something, like a native, that's how you get it, all right? So what I try to do, uh, like when I'm teaching my own kids and when I'm teaching you know, people like you or on uh, like members of Fluent for Life or other programs, uh, I'm trying to make this, uh, I, did a, I did a video, I don't know, a few weeks ago about like how quickly you can get fluent. Uh, and the point is like you, you actually become more fluent in kind of individual bursts as you understand something more. And so if I can help you get those much faster, so these moments, these aha moments of understanding, uh, that's where you get fluent faster. So like if a child, like often a, children, uh, a child or children uh, will just hear the word bicycle, but they don't think anything about bi and cycle. Uh, they only get that later as they get older. So as an example, like a, like a three-year-old who is starting to learn to ride uh, a bike, so when they are three years old, they hear the word bicycle. Uh, maybe when they are 11, they hear like bisect or something else, or bifurcate or you know bilateral or like other words like that. And so this space in here, it's, they, didn't, they didn't like, they didn't do anything wrong by, by like not getting fluent or whatever in this thing or not understanding the word bicycle. It's just that there's a lot of time in between these. So if I can teach an adult bicycle, but in the same day, I can also teach you like all these other meanings. It's like, wow, like by means this. And so when I hear by again, it probably means two or I'm cutting something in half or two pieces or something like that. All right. So that's how you get fluent uh, even faster than natives get fluent. So this is, this is, again, another benefit of being an adult as a learner. You don't have to be young to be a learner, and often it's much better to be an adult because you can control what you learn, okay? Often kids, like if you have a good parent who knows how to teach language well, then you can, you know, you can get that. But often children do not have that example, uh, or they're not getting uh, like that same kind of thing like I just gave you here. Uh, let's see how much time. Well, we almost out of time. Uh, let's see, Dylan. What is the best way to learn phrasal verbs? Because there are a lot. Uh, search our, our channel, our YouTube channel for phrasal verbs, uh, and you will find examples of how to do that. And the visual guide to phrasal verbs also shows you exactly how to do that, too. <coughs> uh, Cita says, let's give Drew likes. People learning English should find him out. Yes, or you should, like, find out about me, find out about me. Uh, but yes, do, do like the video if you enjoy it and uh, share the video with other people who would also like to enjoy it. All right, says, sometimes we function like sponges, absorbing words. Yes, you'd say absorbing. I think that's probably just a typo, but absorb with a B, absorbing. Uh, and Norma Cooks laughing over there, laughing a lot, it looks like. Let's see, XDL, good morning, China. I am eating Bing Keeling. Meme from Zhong Sena. Zhong Sena. Oh, is, that, is that like a like a Chinese joke name, like Zhong Sena instead of John, John Sena, or is that the same thing? Uh, what do you mean learn English as a first language? You should go back and watch the beginning of this video. 
Uh, but basically, the opposite is to learn English as a second language, which means learning it through your native language. And that's what causes you to think and translate in your head before you speak. But if you learn English as a first language, you can actually understand things like a native, so you can communicate like a native. Films are not context-oriented. Films are not context-oriented. Well, there's context in the film, though. All right, hi from Honduras. Love your style. Glad to hear. What is the third season of the year? I just forgot it. Damn. <laughs> well, there's a spring. I guess depending on where you start the year, it could be winter, then spring, summer, fall, or you could call that autumn. So fall or autumn, and then winter again. So we're in fall. My favorite season in Japan, fall. And now I can, it's getting cooler again. Finally. I'm very happy. Yes, it's you, teacher. Glad to hear Rans is a good question in the chat. What do you mean learn English as a first language? All right, hopefully I, I've, I've explained that before, but I definitely, um, there, I have a couple of different videos about that, uh, but also in this video, I'm explaining it. Uh, so if you go back to watch the beginning of this video, you will learn more about that. But the basic idea is that when you understand something, uh, like let's say uh, if, I'm, if I'm trying to teach my children, they can't use any translations because they don't know any other language. They only know the language I'm teaching them. So I have to make the language understandable. So if I'm teaching them English, uh, I have to make it understandable. So as an example, uh, I might like have two, two different kinds of water and one of them, uh, like one bottle is hot water and another bottle is cold water. And so I would just like pour maybe some water on their hand, you know, maybe not too hot, not scalding water, just maybe some hot water and say, look, hot. And then I pour some other water on their hand and say, look, cold. And so they can feel the difference there and so they're learning the language directly. So that's learning English as a first language. Now learning it as a second language means you begin with like, I begin with a Japanese word like atsui or you know tsumetai or whatever for cold water, uh, and then I'm just telling them here is a definition. The problem with that is that when they're in a conversation and they think like, oh, I want cold water, I go to a restaurant and say like cold water, but I have to think first like ah ah tsumetai tsumetai. I'm thinking in my head like ah. Uh, do I do it? Like, now I'm like thinking in Japanese in my head before I speak, uh, and that causes me problems. But my children can just say cold water because they know it directly. So how you learn is how you speak. If you're learning through translations, you will think about translations. All right. Uh, good question. Uh, my fault. Uh, absorber means absorbing my language. Yeah, I, I, I figured. I figured. All right. Well, hopefully that makes sense. Uh, but if you'd like to learn more about understanding the language as a first language, tsumetai, ne? Yeah. So something is like cold. And so you even learn the difference in Japanese. Like I don't say like samui mizu. I say tsumetai mizu because I'm talking about like a cold, cold liquid. So a subtitle doesn't appear in your class, Nasir says. Uh, yes, because the, this is live uh, and subtitles won't appear for maybe a day. So Google is not like just giving me subtitles right as I speak. That would be pretty cool uh, if they did, but they do not do that. But anyway, we have gotten to the end of the video. Uh, I do recommend you go back and watch it if you joined us late, but it really will help people understand how to learn things as a first language uh, and also how to get fluent like a native speaker. So remember, we even want to get fluent faster than natives, and that is possible for you too. Olympia says, uh, the song Stand By Me, the song, the sound of by, the natives say stand by. Yeah, yeah. So they, they're not pronouncing it clearly. I forget the name of that singer. Uh, but yes, and that song is like stand by me, by. It's not like by, stand by me. You're drinking sun, yes. <laughs> yes. Sun tori no misu. Yes, I'm drinking some uh, Sun Tori Mita. It's actually, this, it's just a Sun Tori bottle, but I'm not, um, uh, it's, it's some different water actually that I put in this bottle. But yes, I should get a, I should get a sponsorship from Sun Tori no Mita. Yeah, I'd like say something like that in Japanese for people over there. All right. <laughs> All right, let's see. Lots of practical examples today. Glad to hear it. Thank you, Drew. Nice tiny little bottle. Yes, I like to bring a big water bottle and I'll put it down on the table like, yeah, look at this big bottle and all the Japanese people are like, oh my God, are you drinking that giant bottle of water? 
Yes, uh, I'm, a, I'm a big man, so I need a big bottle of water. My wife has a, like a tiny bottle that she carries. <laughs> I don't know why. I say, why do you, why do you carry? You barely put any water in that, you know. So, anyway, all right. I think that's enough. <laughs> Uh, the way you speak Japanese is so funny. Well, it, it depends on the kind of Japanese I'm speaking. If I'm trying to be like a, like a, a person in a commercial or something. Uh, but that's, that's the way you would see it. It's like, Suntori. Suntori no Mizune. Uh, but, you know, if I'm just speaking, I don't know, regular, regular Japanese and, you know, Suntori no Mizune, you know. <laughs> Oh no, right at the end we get a, uh, an ambulance or a fire truck or something like that. Uh, and this here says, you seem so humble, sir. Well, I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not like famous or important. I'm just trying to help people learn a language the same way I got fluent. You know, it's not. <laughs> I actually can speak a little bit of Japanese. Ah, okay. Yeah, especially if like if anybody's a, a Chinese speaker, they should know some Japanese, I'm guessing. Uh, why are there so many synonyms of an exact word in English? Uh, that's, a, that's a question for another day. <laughs> Can I ask you questions by recording my voice? Uh, don't do that. Just send us an email if you have questions about stuff. But remember, most of the things, uh, the, like the questions people have about learning and speaking, uh, are, uh, are answered by the videos that we have. All right. Cedar says, thanks, Drew. Your work in, uh, on YouTube is precious. <laughs> Glad to hear it. Sam says, your facial expressions is everything uh, when speaking Japanese. Yeah, I can, try to, I, I can try to be more serious. Konnichiwa. Yoroshiku onegaishimasu. Ima kara ne, eigo oshitai to omoimasu ne. All right, so I could, I could like just be like that, or I could be, uh, I don't know, like, like samurai. Konnichiwa onegaishimasu. You know, I, I get like, you know, crazy, crazy about the, the water, like samurai, samurai drinking, drinking water. All right. Uh, let's see. Last, last question before we get out of here. All right. Ryan says, would you say that when you uh, learn something new in Japanese every week? Yeah, I learn something new every day. Anyway, when I watch movies uh, with subtitles in English instead of Japanese, I watch subtitles uh, before I know it. Do you think that hope helps me improve? Wait a minute. Let me read that again. I watch movies with subtitles in English instead of Japanese. I watch subtitles. Do you think that helps me improve my English, or should I watch? If you're if you're watching an English movie with English subtitles, that's fine. Like a close, uh, close caption, that's fine. Uh, but like the meaning will often be different. So if you're watching an English movie with Japanese subtitles in it, it will change the meaning slightly. So often, like I remember going, I went to a lecture by uh, a Japanese. A Japanese woman who does she's like pretty famous for subtitling a lot of movies and she was explaining how she did it and, and often there's not a lot of space there so you have to take something and like make the meaning much different and, and compress it down uh, to, to fit there um, so in general I recommend people watch things that either have all English subtitles or watch something easier for you uh, that you can understand without the subtitle all right, Yes, and just want to thank you for your time. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Do you try Japanese yoga? I don't know what that is, Japanese yoga. That's like a different yoga than other yoga or something? I don't know. So in general, what you want to do is understand English in English. And if you still need your native language, then you should make, maybe go a little bit easier or make sure you can find something that, uh, that's more understandable. All right, well, now I actually do have to shut this down. Natsuko. No, no, no. Uh, now we got the Japanese and Japanese people coming out here. All right. Well, everybody do like the video. Uh, if you have any questions, you can post them in the comments uh, after I get this live uh, as a replay. Uh, and remember to click on the links in the description below this video so you can learn more about Fluent for Life if you want to become a fluent speaker, as well as Frederick if you'd like to improve your listening and pronunciation. All right. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, my goodness. Maria. Maria, why do you have to come right in at the end like this? Oh, no. Let's see. Let's see here. Pronounce quickly as I can hear the D at the end. Yes, so pronunciation is, again, one of those things that you'll improve. Uh, your listening and your pronunciation will improve as you understand more like a native. But to learn more about that, just click on the links in the description, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.